Hello. Uh, welcome to um, welcome to Archival Adventures. Um, I'm hearing my voice. One second. Okay, I do not understand. <laughs> I thought I had it figured out, but apparently I don't have it figured out. I want you to hear me, and I want me not to hear me. But somehow, <laughs> that's not happening. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. That'll be something for me to work on uh, between th this week and next, because I don't think I'm going to get it fixed today. I don't know why it did that. Okay. Well, enjoy the music and enjoy listening to me talk because it is way too distracting to hear my own voice in my ears when I'm doing this. So I, I won't get to hear the music. Let me know if the levels are wacky, and I will have to figure out the, um, the sound routing. It's so close, it's so close. I actually have it so that I can control the microphone volume in OBS, which is a big step forward, because I did not have that capability before. Um, <clears throat> and, and now I do, but I still haven't figured out how I can listen and hear the output, but not hear my voice, which is supposed to be a relatively easy thing to do. But for some reason, when I switch it to um, monitor off, which means that you should hear the audio and I shouldn't, uh, that doesn't work. So I'm going to have to look at that. Anyway. <laughs> That's all by the by. Welcome to Archival Adventures, everybody. <laughs> um, the lighting isn't perfect today, but this is the best I could do, uh, given the time I had to work with. Um, I got the room set up, but I was, I was trying to get all the audio connections up and running. And um, clearly, I ran out of time. But we're functional enough to still have a stream. So. If you're unfamiliar, welcome. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. And um, Wednesday afternoons, I share things from Special Collections and University Archives here on stream. This stream is going out to two Twitch channels at the same time. Um, it goes to twitch.tv slash vtulstudios, as well as twitch.tv slash rogan27, which is my personal channel. So it goes out to the libraries, and my own. Um, and it tends to be a little chaotic, but a fun time overall. Um, but yeah, welcome everybody. It is good to have people here. Hello, Stephen Joyce. It is wonderful to see you. Uh, Hannah, it's lovely to have you joining. Lord Portico, it's good to see you. Anybody else who happens to be here and has not commented in chat, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, I also, I added a lovely little, um, I don't know which way I have to point. A thing that will tell you what song is playing. Um, 
we get them uh, royalty free. <clears throat> like they, they are, they, but, but yeah, I have added a thing that will let you know what music happens to be playing as, as we're watching things in case, in case you're wondering and because I'd like to give credit to the people that did the music. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, current, we're playing the music through a tool called Pretzel Rocks um, and yeah, so that is new. Um, I should I should move into the the actual like talking about stuff, huh? So as we do at the top of every one of these streams, we are uh, just going to pay attention to a little bit of the history of the institution. Um, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland. We recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families uh, that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute. They also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to prosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> okay, so what are we looking at today? Um, this is this is again. Uh, I think this is the second one where my student assistant um, did the primary preparation for the episode. So um, I don't really know a whole lot about what we're going to look at. Except that I had looked at this and, and picked it for an episode that we did previously, and we never got to it. So I'm at least familiar with at least one or two items in it. I also think it's a really interesting collection. Um, and so this should be this should be kind of interesting. Oh gosh, I never updated Moobot. Um, whoopsie. <laughs> um, Hold one one moment. Oh, I have the text. I can just send it to you. I just have to grab it. Um, like it's already written. It just needs a copy paste. Uh, and I, you know, I try to do everything, <laughs> but apparently, I forgot that. The last time I updated Moobot was before I took a week off of work. It's okay though. Um, we'll, we'll get there. It's all a work in progress. Uh, here, I will let you all take a look at the information we have available, which isn't much, um, while I deal with this. Uh, All right, I dropped it in the um, the mod chat, and I will I will update it for the other channel. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, that was a whoops. Uh, 
unless okay I seem to have already updated it for the very strange anyway let's not dwell um, <clears throat> I don't know anything about this person apparently um, this collection the Robert Eldred Taylor papers um, let's see uh, it's a one folder collection so it's a really small collection and there's not a whole lot of info here so let's see um, scope and contents selective service records of Taylor of Larned, Kansas during World War II. Taylor was disqualified from aviation cadet training due to colorblindness and entered the enlisted reserve corps and was assigned an active status to Pan American World Airways in Miami, Florida. In 1945, Taylor had to go in front of the Selective Service Board again for possible duty. Um, yeah, that's it. Like, it doesn't tell me anything. Um, this is less information than we would typically like in a finding aid and in fact is missing some of our required fields um, that we would require now. I have no idea when it was processed, who processed it. I don't even know, I don't have any note in here about where did we get this from. Um, there's usually, usually we would do at minimum, like a short sentence about who is this person. It's not there. So we're going to have to discover that either by searching the internet or um, from the documents themselves. I know nothing about this Robert, Robert Eldred Taylor person from um, uh, Larned, Kansas, but we're going to learn. Um, the one clue that I have is subjects and indexing terms where it says Archives of American Aerospace Exploration. Um, AAAE is a subset of our History of Science and Technology collections. Um, and so the fact that it's associated with AAAE um, might give some guidance as to like when we got it, where it came from, that type of stuff, because we have a lot of stuff that falls under that scope, but most of the stuff that falls under AAAE is similar to this, where it is barely processed. Um, and we've seen some of the AAAE stuff. Um, in fact, uh, when Bess came and joined and we looked at the, those design things, um, like the, the design stuff for mass producing helicopter blades and things like that, um, that was all part of AAAE. So, I don't actually know, um, personally, when or, or what. I know we have it. I don't know much about it, so I'm going to find out. Uh, and you all can, you know, tag along while I do. Um, no, I didn't want emojis. Thank you. Um, so this is our website. And I'm going to our collections section. And I want um, science and technology. Archives of American Aerospace Exploration. What's funny is I built this page, but I have never read this section before. <laughs> this was just, I, I built the page, but this was copy paste text. Um, <clears throat> established in 1986, the Archives of American Aerospace Exploration preserves and makes accessible uh, published and unpublished materials that document American aeronautical and space history, as well as related sciences. The collection includes books and articles, letters, notes, photographs, reminiscences, memorabilia, oral histories, patents, uh, or patents, however you want to say it, and drawings slash schematics. Current holdings comprise more than three dozen collections of paper from pilots, astronauts, physicists, chemists, engineers, 
Uh, NACA and NASA uh, administrators and project managers, uh, writers, illustrators, and researchers in industry and academia. Um, so potentially acquired as early as 86. I do not know this doesn't say, and I would have to dig into like our behind the scenes stuff to, to find out for sure. Um, I'm uncertain as to who um, initially started compiling the Archives of American Aerospace Exploration. Given that they have that sort of title, I'm guessing it was something where somebody had started collecting this and then we acquired it from them. Um, because uh, we don't typically name uh, collections in this way. So, that's all beside the point though, because we're going to actually look at these documents from uh, Taylor, Robert Eldred Taylor, and uh, see what we can learn. This is it, this is the entire collection. Just, just some papers, one folder. Um, I have three highlights noted from uh, my student assistant. Rejection card for cadet training, documents pertaining to Pan America flights, and recall orders slash physicals. So those are the things um, that seemed apparently to be interesting. Um, I want to start with the very first item in here that has the photograph because it's a photograph. The only thing I fi really find on Robert Eldred Taylor is a record on Ancestry.com that just states he died in 1965. Um, are you looking, uh, I was, the blah, is that the free access or is that um, the, uh, do you have like, what level of access do you have to Ancestry is, is what I'm trying to ask. Um, and the only other relevant thing I can find is the finding aid. You have the free access. I um, potentially have access to additional information and we, we can search together in a second. I, I, I can bring Ancestry up on the screen and we can take a look and see uh, what we can find with the library access to Ancestry, um, which is, allows slightly more than just the, the public free access. Um, oh, I wanted to go closer. So, we have a photograph, which, heck, half the time we do not have a photograph, and we have a photograph and we know who it is. This is Robert Taylor. Um, given that it is attached to this card, I assume this is Robert Taylor in 1942, but I don't know for certain. Um, but this is like the size and shape that, um, it makes me think of a passport photo, but um, so like official purposes type photograph. It's straight on headshot, square shaped photo, um, which was typical for like, it, it's the type of photo that you would have to send in if you were getting a passport um, or things like that, uh, at least in the 90s when I got a passport for the first time. Um, I honestly have no idea uh, about practice before that, but that is what it brings to mind for me is um, like standard shape and size uh, and, and pose for an official photograph like that. Um, <clears throat> so we have this card and 
you know, last name Taylor, first name Robert, middle name, we just have the initial E uh, noted here. This is to certify that the above named is not qualified for avi aviation cadet training, uh, apparently also known as air crew. We don't have a date of application, but a physical examination was done on May 8th, 1942. Um, a screening test on May 7th, 1942, with a score of 97. Um, presumably that score is out of 100, so a good score. Uh, at the station in Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, signed by John Wynn, John T. Wynn, um, president or recorder of board. Uh, and so John T. Wynn was a first lieutenant infantry and was the recorder. And then if rejected, cause. Rejected due to colorblindness, uh, noted on the card. So not eligible for aviation candidate training uh, for the US Army because of colorblindness. This form will be prepared in duplicate by every aviation cadet examining board immediately upon qualification. Original card to be given to cadet and duplicate to be mailed directly to something. Uh, which clearly whatever, wherever it's supposed to go is a problem with their typewriter because both times they typed that word, I don't know, it looks like maybe 7-1-C-A-R-O, but I don't know. Um, whatever it is, it's their typewriter that's the problem because it has the same gap in the letters. Uh, this is form number 24, March 15th, 1942. So at this point, I think it would help to understand a little bit about selective service, aviation cadet training, things like that. So if anybody feels like looking that up um, and sharing in chat, that would be helpful. I mean, I can do, but uh, if somebody wants to look it up, I'm gonna, We'll, we'll take a glance at this card and then we'll dive in uh, to the information about, you know, what is selective service, um, since this one specifically references selective service. So, <clears throat> July 25th, 1942, University of Wichita, Wichita, Kansas. Um, let's see, to selective service headquarters for reference to local board. This certifies that Robert Eldred Taylor enlisted here for the U.S. Army. His registration certificate number 226 shows registration as follows. Uh, let's see, Third Ward, Larned, Kansas. We have an address. <laughs> let's see, um, Horace Heath was the recruiting officer, Lieutenant Colonel Infantry. Um, and so we've got a couple of copies of that card. So enlisted in the selective service. Um, going to bring up a website and then we'll we'll take a glance at it because what is selective service hey Hannah thank you for dropping in um, for dropping in the the information there um, the selective service system SSS is an independent agency of the United States government that maintains information on US citizens and other US residents potentially subject to military conscription um, that is the draft and carries out contingency planning and preparations for two types of draft. A general draft, 
based on registration lists of men aged 18 to 25, and a special skills draft based on professional licensing lists of workers in spe specified healthcare occupations. So, essentially, uh, he had registered for the draft. Um, And registration to this day, registration if, uh, by males between the ages of 18 and 25 is mandatory. Uh, selective service registration is required by law as the first part of a fair and equitable system that, if authorized by the President and Congress, would rapidly provide personnel to the Department of Defense while at the same time providing for an alternative service program for conscientious obje objectors. By registering, a young man remains eligible for jobs, state-based student aid in 31 states, federally funded job training, and U.S. Citizen citizenship for immigrant men. Um, so, yeah, uh, it, it doesn't... It doesn't make it super clear in that sentence, but if you um, are male in the United States and you fail to register <laughs> for selective service um, when you turn 18, you can't get a job. <laughs> it is illegal to employ you. Uh, so anyway. Um, Additional groups, the law currently requires that only men register in the event that the law is changed to include registering women. Selective service is prepared to expand registration. Um, so yeah, that's this is the official like government website for it. I want some history though. Um, and I don't know that their website has history. History and records. This is this is what we want to know about this organization. And because um, we want to understand why he was registering for it. Um, and then we can start looking at uh, he was apparently rejected for aviation cadet training because he was colorblind. Uh, so we're going to want to explore that uh, as we look through the documents. Let's see. Though the selective service system as we know it today was not in use, the United States has used systems of conscription since the Revolutionary War era. Conscription was used in World War I, with the draft mechanism in both instances being dissolved at the end of hostilities. In 1940, so um, roughly two years before the first document that we have in this collection, prior to U.S. entry in World War II, the first peacetime draft in our nation's history was enacted in response to increased world tension and the system was able to fill wartime manpower needs smoothly and rapidly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. At the end of the war, the draft law was allowed to expire, but it was reenacted less than two years later to maintain necessary military manpower levels as a result of the Cold War. From 1948 to 73, uh, which is well beyond the time that we're looking at with this collection, so I'm not going to dig into that. Um, but yeah, so basically starting in 1940, um, the peacetime registration, <clears throat> peacetime draft was instituted. But the documents that we have are from 1942. So did it just take him two years to like get around to registering or what? Nice little history section covering 1940 to 47 in the wiki that you linked. Okay. Yeah, I've, um, I've been to the wiki. I wanted to explore this site real quick, <coughs> but we will go over there in just a second. Um, Cause in, in advance of uh, today, I had glanced at the wiki. Uh, let's see. Selective Service System was created as an independent agency with a director responsible to the president. Mm -hmm. Seven mass registrations were conducted. Uh, age was originally set 21 to 35. Oh, there we go. That's probably it. He probably um, aged into being required to register in 42. 
and that's why the documents start then. So he probably turned 21 in 1935, or 19, sorry, he probably turned 21 in 1942. I was looking at that, uh, at the number 35, and um, yeah. Okay. Ooh, selection and induction. A lottery system established the order of call after volunteers were first inducted. After three national lotteries, order numbers were then based on birth dates. Age groups for induction were established. Pre-induction physical examinations assessed a person's acceptability. Registrants were then inducted by armed forces, which made the final determination of acceptability. So based on the documents that we have here, it's also possible that um, that he actually registered earlier, and we just don't have that document. Um, hi, Meridu. Uh, let me pull up the wiki. <clears throat> So we want 1940. And yeah, this is a pretty good, let me see if I can boost the font size a little without it being really badly formatted. <laughs> 1940 to 1947, Selective Service and Training Act of 1940 was passed by Congress on 16 September 1940, uh, establishing the first peacetime conscript conscription in the United States history requiring all men between ages of 18 and 64 to register. Um, to register, they completed a DDS Form 1 military draft registration card from the Director of Selective Service, which I do not believe we have a copy of that card. Uh, in this collection, at least. Um, over 49 million draft cards were completed, including the old man's draft. Uh, what is the old man's draft, I wonder? The colloquial term for the fourth selective service registration sequence held in the United States during World War II in April of 1942. Okay, now that's getting really close to the first document that we have here, which is May 7th. So we might want to glance a little bit more at the old man's draft uh, as we move forward because uh, potentially relevant. Originally conscripted all men aged 21 to 35 for a service period of 12 months. The military service period was extended to 18 months. Uh, later that year, the age bracket was increased to include men aged 18 to 37 following Pearl Harbor and the subsequent declarations of war by the US. Uh, okay. Nineteen forty five State of the Union, uh, President Roosevelt requested that the draft be expanded to include female nurses. Male nurses were not allowed uh, to overcome a shortage that was endangering military medical care. This began a debate over the drafting of all women, which was defeated in the House of Representatives. A bill to draft nurses was passed by the House but died without a vote in the Senate. A public, the public, blah, blah, blah. the publicity caused more nurses to volunteer and agencies streamlined recruiting. It was, uh, the, the, that draft was, or, yeah, ended in March of 1947. So I think one of the more relevant things to the collection we're looking at today might be this old man's draft. If the birth date, birth date I found is accurate, he would have been 36 in 1942, which would make sense. Um, because according to the information here, um, required age for registration increased from 35 to 37 uh, in 
And I'm guessing that that must have been in April of 42. And so him undergoing review in May of 42 would make sense. The first peacetime conscription in American history was authorized under Selective Training and Service Act of 1940 in September 1940. This was well in advance of the country's actual entry into World War II, but in clear anticipation of the likelihood of involvement. Registration began with those aged between 21 and 35, and gradually broadened to men aged between 18 and 64? as needs increased after the country entered the war in December 1941. Whoa! Um, on April 27, 1942, the fourth registration was held nationwide, which encompassed men from the ages of 45 to 64. Okay, that is not relevant to him. Uh, so I'm going to need to figure out when was it the third draft, maybe, when it went from 35 to 37 as the age range? But anyway, born between April 27, 1877 and February 16, 1897, earning it the nickname of the Old Man's Draft. Unlike earlier registrations, its purpose was indirect. The individuals were not actually liable for military service. This registration was essentially a very broad inventory of manpower and skills useful to the war effort, potentially bringing underutilized or unemployed men back into a more fruitful occupation and allowing for the release of easily replaceable younger or more fit men to fight. Huh. Wow. I... So... Not relevant to Taylor, but also just wow. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I sometime in nineteen forty one. Wait, in 1941, the military service period was extended to 18 months. And then later in 1941, the age bracket was increased from 18 to 35 to 18 to 37. Um, I would need to dig in to their references to find the source. It looks like... It looks like the source cited for this section is this Joseph Connor Drafting Women, World War II magazine. Um, so, uncertain, but anyway, he ended up having to register for the draft. <laughs> so, um, also, we have, we have, um, a raid coming in. Hello! Welcome, uh, 16-Bit Eric. Welcome, everybody, from, um, the League of Whimsy. Uh, it is great to have you joining us. Um, if you're new here, I am Rogan27. Uh, since you're coming in on that channel, I am, uh, also... <laughs> <laughs> known on the internet, or known in real, I don't know. I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech, and um, you're here for my archives show, which is called Archival Adventures. It happens um, weekly on Wednesdays, uh, at, starting at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, where I share um, historical documents from Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. This show goes out on two channels. Um, it goes out on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, uh, the Virginia Tech University Libraries channel, as well as my own, Rogan27. Um, so welcome in, everybody. It is great to have you here. Um, and yeah, uh, Shadows of Life, it's good to see you. Thank you for dropping the shout out uh, for 16-Bit Eric. Indeed, if you are here and you're not already following 16-Bit Eric, you should follow 16-Bit Eric. Eric is um, 
an absolutely wonderful individual with a wonderful community. Um, you can definitely, definitely learn a lot uh, from watching about life, about TTRPGs, about being kind and humble and uh, just, you know, it's, it's all around a good time. Definitely worth a follow. Um, Baba Yeeha, hello. Um, uh, Blue Rooster, it's good to see you, hello. Um, also, hi, uh, Hall Reaver, welcome. Thank you for the follow. Uh, so today we are looking at a very small collection of materials about um, Robert Eldred Taylor, uh, who was from uh, Larned, Kansas. We don't know much about him. We do know um, <clears throat> most of what we have here is related to um, review for aviation cadet training with the um, US Army Air Corps uh, and uh, selective service registration in 1942. Um, so we were just digging into information about like the history of the US Selective Service, um, which is the official um, name of the draft, the US draft. So uh, we were looking at some of the history of the United States draft, the first civilian draft happening in 1940. Um, and we were just looking at, uh, it looks like sometime in late 1941, the required age for a, for registration for the draft, uh, went from 18 to 35 to 18 to 37. And Taylor at the time was 36 years of age. So, um, <laughs> that gives us a hint as to why he would have been registering. Um, all right, let's continue looking. He was initially registered, uh, like, the first document we looked at was he was rejected for aviation cadet training um, because he was colorblind. And then we've got copies of confirmations, um, noting that he did enlist for the US Army. So this was being sent to the Selective Service Headquarters uh, because he would have been subject to Selective Service, but he enlisted in the Army, um, meaning he signed up to serve uh, not just registering for the draft. Um, so we have copies of the confirmation card that would have been sent to the Selective Service to let them know he's no longer subject to the draft because he signed up for the Army. Um, I did note, uh, it looks like there will be uh, an ad or ads playing on um, the Rogan 27 channel in just a couple of minutes. Um, they play sort of automatically and I don't really have a lot of control over it. Um, so we will possibly take a couple of minutes of a break, um, which I've not typically done during this show, but honestly, I should. It's been about an hour since we started and so um, We'll, we'll, we'll take a break here in just a couple of, of minutes. Gives us a chance to stand up, get a beverage, stretch, etc. Some self-care time. <clears throat> so here we have um, an identification card for the Enlisted Reserve Corps. This is to certify that Robert E. Taylor, Private Air Corps, Serial number 17115346, uh, um, home address in Larned, Kansas, was enlisted in uh, asterisk, what is the asterisk? Cross out words not applicable, got it. Was enlisted in, grades shown in Enlisted Reserve Corps, Enlisted Reserve Corps of 
the Army of the United States on the 25th day of July, 1942. For the period of D-O-W? Okay, this will take some investigation because I don't know what this is. Uh, D-O-W and then it looks like P-L. Wait. There are more letters there, but I don't know what they say um, because they're typed over the word year, but there's P-L something something something, either two or three more letters, um, and then six months. When enlisted, he was 21 years of age and by occupation an abstractor. So probably not the person who you were looking at. Um, yeah, it's not the person you found in Ancestry because he was... He was 21. Um, he has gray eyes, brown hair, medium complexion, and is five foot six inches in height. Um, there's spots to note down immunizations, but nothing is noted. Um, given at the headquarters at Wichita, Kansas on the 25th day of July, uh, 1942, and uh, signed by Horace Heath. W-D-A-G-O, form number 116. I don't know what W-D-A-G-O stands for, but um, I can't investigate absolutely everything. I'm just curious about all of it. And we don't have enough time for me to dig into every single thing. But um, we've got Robert Taylor's signature and thumbprint. Um, instructions for reservists upon making change of address. Immediately upon making a change of residence, a member of the Enlisted Reserve Corps will notify his commanding officer of the fact or the Corps Area Commander, if not assigned to a unit, stating his new place of residence and address. He will also send a duplicate copy of the report to the Corps Area Commander in the event he is assigned to a unit. The re report should be made on WD AGO Form Number 167, Individual Report of Enlisted Reservist which may be obtained from the nearest army station or post. However, it may be by letter, postcard, or prepaid telegram. <laughs> letter, postcard, or prepaid telegram. Huh. Yeah, not even to the point of faxing information around. Um. Cool. All right. Uh, we've got more. There's plenty more, but um, I don't want to lose stuff to um, the ads playing, and they should be starting soon. So I think we are maybe gonna... Sorry, it gave me a pop-up that said ads will start soon, but now I don't see when. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, one second. I'm gonna figure it out. Or not. Where is it? This one. Add this one. <laughs> oh gosh. That's a badly placed panel, but at least it's in existence now. It just says starting soon. So, um, yeah, it is going to start playing three minutes of ads at any second. Uh, so I'm going to, we'll go on a quick break and I will see you in a couple of minutes. Um, I encourage you to stretch, uh, get something to drink, etc. We're going to dig into more of this information um, when we get back from the break. There's a career here that is very interesting. So I will see you in just a, just a moment.
Hello? I, I'm, I am hopeful that you can hear me now. Zounds, yeah, I don't understand. Well, I will have to play with that um, because that is not how those settings should work, but that is how they are working, so I need to figure out why, but not on stream. Um, anyway, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, quickly, we'll just glance at, we have the registration certificate. This is, um, this is what we saw referenced earlier. This is the Selective Service Registration Card. Um, this is to certify that in accordance with the Selective Service Proclamation of the President of the United States, Robert Eldred Taylor uh, of Larned, Kansas, has been duly registered the 16th day of February, 1942. Signed by LCG Bird, uh, registrar for Local Board 1 of Larned, Kansas. The law requires you to have this card in your personal possession at all times. Um, gosh, it's been a while since I saw a draft card. Description of, res uh, of registrant. So uh, white, hazel eyes, apparently dark brown hair because uh, you can see initially marked as black and then changed to brown um, with a dark complexion. That, that's everything that's marked on there. Um, anyway, not much to see on that other than, hey, that's what a, a draft card looked like in the 1940s. Um, <clears throat> we have a telegram uh, because as I noted before our quick break, pre-faxes. Western Union, uh, which is a company still in operation today, I believe for wiring money and, and such, but, oh yes, there were indeed historical terms on the, uh, the back of the, um... mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna linger on them, but, but they were there and yeah. <laughs> Indeed, as we review unedited historical documents, we may encounter words, phrases, images, or other content that are derogatory, harmful, or wildly inaccurate, now and or in their historical context. So, yeah, feel free to take care of yourself as needed. Um, so, Western Union, uh, let's see, duplicate of telephone telegram, Larned, Kansas. Uh, July 24th, I think it's 9 p.m. Um, oh, geez. Uh, Ah, sorry, I got a, a, a moderator message and I'm responding real quick. Um, see. Uh, looks like it was addressed to Roy Elliott, Wichita University coordinator and co coordinator ANS, date Wichita, Kansas. I'm not certain what that means. Um, how is the kerning so bad on this? Uh, well, uh, presumably a very, very well-used typewriter. 
Shadows of Life. I'm, I'm not certain, but that's my best guess, is very well-used typewriter. Uh, release granted Robert Eldred Taylor to join Air Corps Reserve Local Board of Pawnee County, uh, 259P, charge phone 45331. So this was dated the day before... This telegram is dated the day before the um, enlistment, which is two months after um, being rejected for uh, the aviation cadet training because of colorblindness. Um, So, uh, giving permission, I'm not certain. Um, and then we've got a certificate from the United States Navy, Gulf Sea Frontier. Let's see, I, I need to zoom out. Uh, zoom out, show the document. All right, US Navy. Um, All right, so we've got Navy. Uh, to all persons who shall see these presents, greeting. Be it known that this certificate is awarded to Robert E. Taylor for his patriotic effort in completing the Gulf Sea Frontier Transport Pilot Recognition Course, 16 October, 1943. Um, so, Enlisted in the Army, did some flight training uh, with the Navy on a Gulf Sea Frontier. This is signed by Rear Admiral USN Commander Gulf Sea Frontier. Um, so yeah, two months after he tried to enter the aviation cadet training program and was rejected for colorblindness, there was a release granted for him to join the Air Corps Reserve. And then um, three months later, he's got this certificate from the Navy. Like uh, the all fancy script, then the stenciled name. Hang on, I might be missing part of your comment. Uh, just a couple of bots to take care of, and uh, and okay, that's done. Uh, like the, all the fancy scripts and the stenciled name, it looks like. I mean, so this appears to have been a pre-printed certificate. It's like what you would get today honestly, um, where it, it's generally pre-printed and then somebody, it honestly, I don't know that I can make it visible on stream, but I can try. Because um, if you look at an angle, if you get the lighting at the proper angle on the um, lettering, and I don't know that it's, it's gonna show up or get picked up by the camcorder, um, All of this stuff is the same ink, except the name. The name is slightly shinier. Um, I believe that the name was actually hand done with a marker, like a felt tip type marker is what it looks like. Very neatly done, but it looks to me like it was done with felt tip and then um, some, then it was signed. So there's three different inks that I'm seeing on here, um, just at a glance. If I had an ALS of some sort, an alternative light source, it would be easier to identify. Um, 
specifically the different inks and, and if it was necessary to go to that level of investigation, um, that, that would be like the technique to go forward. But just at a glance, the way that the light shines off of the different printed parts, etc., cetera, um, and sort of, I can tell that like the, the serifs on the letters, that there was marker going over marker. Uh, because of the way that it, it's shiny and I can see a little bit of texture, um, which tells me that the name is handwritten on there. Um, so he can't fly with the Army Air Corps, but he can with the Navy. Um, Blue Rooster, it is the same guy. He was rejected for colorblindness from the aviation cadet training in the U.S. Army Air Corps, but then two months later, there was a release granted for him to join the Army Air Corps. And then he got training from the U.S. Navy on the Gulf Sea Frontier plane. But as far as I can tell, he was in the U.S. Army Air Corps. This is just a certificate um, of training he took with the Navy. So, um, let's see. Headquarters, Gulf Sea Frontier, DuPont Building, Miami, Florida, 22nd November, so another month further on. Oh, no, this is 1943 now. Um, oh, wait, no, that was... The October one was also 43. Dear Sir, it is with pleasure that I enclose certificate evidencing your completion of the Gulf Sea Frontier Transport Pilot Recognition Course. Um... Yours very truly, E.B. Nixon, Captain, U.S. Navy, Intelligence Officer, uh, addressed to Mr. Robert E. Taylor, Pan American Airways Incorporated, care of Chief Pilot's Office, E.D., Coconut Grove, Miami, Florida. And so this was actually, the certificate was enclosed with that. Um, I can't tell, Maridu. I... It looks to me like the date is also handwritten, but I, in the lighting that I am currently in, it is much harder to tell. I do think that the date is also giving me a little bit of shininess, um, indicating that it might be a similar type of ink or marker to what was used for the name but it's less, much less prominent and not as obvious um, at a quick glance. <laughs> I could only dream of handwriting that neat. I know, really? Like, I, my handwriting is nowhere close to that pretty, um, but somebody, somebody worked hard on, uh, on making it look pretty. Um, yeah, so those go together. Let's see, what else we got, what else we got? I also, I did look in Ancestry, and I have yet to glance and see what we found in Ancestry, but um, it looks like the next document I have is 1945. That's assuming that everything is in roughly chronological order, which it has been so far, and I don't see any reason to think that it won't be, but we'll see. Um... Army Service Forces, Headquartered Fourth Service Command. Oh, come on. Come on, camcorder. You can, you can focus. Uh, let me try zooming out. Maybe it'll focus better here. Yeah, I don't know why it didn't want to focus um, at the next zoom level, but whatever. Um, 30 July, 1945. Uh, Robert E. Taylor. Discharge is the subject. Uh, so two years later, let's see, to Robert E. Taylor, uh, living in Miami, Florida, attached, here too is your honorable discharge certificate from the Army of the United States Enlisted Reserve Corps, which was issued under provisions of the Army regulations ind indicated below. Um, reason for discharge, let's see, so, it looks like discharged on, uh, oh, the authority is paragraph 11A, 
AR615363 IO or possibly 10 uh, November 1944. Reason for discharge change in personnel training requirements. Each man discharged who has passed his 18th birthday is subject to the provisions of the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940 as amended and should contact his local Selective Service Board within five days. State Director of Selective Service Concerned has been advised in connection with your discharge by command of Major General Brooks, uh, signed Harry O. Smith, Major QMC, uh, Chief Procurement Branch, MPD, stamped with a CNK stamp. I don't know what all these abbreviations are. Um, if, if this was like a personal project and I had unlimited time, I would definitely dig in and like learn about all of those different um, abbreviations, but that is a rabbit hole. I'm not certain we have time for unless somebody wants to do it and drop it in chat. Um, one inclusion, WD AGO form number 5355. Uh, I don't know that we have that. I don't know that we don't, but I don't know that we do. So um, let's see. Oh, there's a stamp. Oh, it's just a mailed headquarters, uh, mailed on 30th, July, 1945. So discharge from the Army Reserves in July of 45, August of 45, August 4th, 1945. Um, we have the Pawnee County Selective Service Board. Yes, there is actually a Pawnee County in Kansas. Um, and Larned is in Pawnee County. Uh, dear sirs, this is to notify you that I have received an honorable discharge from the Army of the United States. Uh, Air Corps Enlisted Reserve, effective July 30, 1945. I enlisted July 25, 1942 at Wichita, Kansas, and upon finishing my prescribed flight training in February of 1943, was assigned on an inactive status to Pan American World Airways, Miami, Florida, to fly as first officer, co-pilot, in the Latin American division. It is my understanding that Pan American is asking deferment in my case, and if any additional information is needed for your files, I shall be glad to send it. I was married in May of this year, and my present address is 1242 Southwest 12th Avenue, Miami, uh, Florida. Sincerely yours, Robert E. Taylor. So, this document actually is super, super useful. It gives a lot of good information. Um, and gives us some additional things that we can use to try and find a record of him in Ancestry, um, which let's just see if we can find him. I don't see a reason not to try. Um, so this is the uh, Ancestry Library Edition. <laughs> oh, you found a, a potential Robert Taylor? I'm gonna show how I do, how we do a, an Ancestry search. Um, so the address, I, I would imagine that uh, Robert Taylor does not live there anymore, um, but these documents are plenty old enough that it um, is not typically, or probably isn't an issue. Um, I can always go and edit them out of the VOD if I have to. I, I will look into it. Um, so I, I appreciate the link, um, Hannah. I am going to show how it, how a search works on here though. So um, I'm actually gonna try doing the search. So we know uh, enlisted at Wichita. 
married in 1945, and we know he was 21 in 1942. Um, so birth year, roughly 1921. Uh, more search options. There was a marriage in 1945 and lived in uh, 1945 in Miami. Now, putting in this much information um, can make it harder to find documents, even relevant documents. Is that map of the day giant blue balloons invaded the U.S.? Uh, sorry, uh, Detective Zen. It, it's actually, um, that was a general, like, um, that was the search page for Ancestry Library Edition. Used to work with an oral history center as the audio engineer, and a lot of what I did was edit out people's address or social security numbers because interviewees kept reading them out. Yeah. Okay, so we have an... Uh, a Robert Eldred Taylor, born 6 August 1920 in Larned, Kansas. Um, U.S. World War II draft cards. Oh, that's the same handwriting. As on the draft card that we have. <laughs> It's exactly the same handwriting. And that is his signature. So this document is definitely, uh, so I have DSS form two. This is DSS form one. Um, which we don't actually have a copy of. Um, Come on, go back. Um, so far, like, I, I'm, this search gives me access to, like, documents. Less often will I actually find, like, a family tree that actually is somewhat reliable, but usually we're, we're looking for the documents. Um, it looks like possibly this uh, 1950 census. The age 29, birth date 1921, um, married as of 1950, yeah. Living with his mother in law or father in law in Larned. Six August 1920. Ooh, this one should be him. Uh, died 20th July 1994 in Fernandia Beach, Florida. And is buried back home in Larned. Was married to um, Weeda Taylor, looks like. So this is the type of search that we would typically do in preparing the finding aid so that we could get a little bit of information to put in a biographical note um, about the person whose papers it is, um, which is why when I first pulled up the finding aid at the beginning of the stream and there was no bi biographical information at all, um, I noted that that was unusual because usually, like, we've got access, we go in there, and part of doing the finding aid is looking that information up. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. September, September 4th, 1945. This is a, a note from the Selective Service System. 
um, again, Pawnee County. Uh, Mr. Robert Taylor, Miami, Florida. Dear sir, the local board has received a request from the state director to reopen your case and consider anew the evidence for your deferment. Now, I don't understand the case for deferment. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm going to finish reading this and maybe it will give me some, interest, uh, some in, uh, information um, that we will be useful. I don't know. Um, the state director said in part, quote, while these civilian pilots filled a necessary place in the war effort, the fact remains that they were not required to face enemy fire and were in the status of civilians drawing top wartime wages. It is thought by this headquarters that so long as replacements are needed by the armed forces, this registrant should be required to serve a tour of duty thus relieving someone who, due to age or long service, should be released from further service. For local board number one, Pawnee County, Marjorie C. Van Horn, clerk, carbon copy to Pan American Airways. I don't understand. Are they in favor of his deferment or against it? And what is deferment, what does it mean in this case? Let's, let's see if, so I know, so he enlisted in the reserves and then he was told uh, when, when he got discharged from the reserves, he was told you have to register for selective service. And then he contacted the Selective Service Board, giving him his background, because he was, assigned to inactive status and assigned to work for Pan American World Airways. So I'm guessing Pan American wanted him to keep flying for them and wanted deferment from selective service so that he could do so. That's what I'm, that's sort of the story I'm getting from looking at the documents. I don't know uh, because I'm not 100% certain and I would need to dig a little bit into what a deferment means. Um, let's see. Uh, this is October 26, 1945, Selective Service System Order to Report Pre-Induction Physical Examination. The President of the United States to Robert Eldred Taylor, greeting. You are hereby directed to report for pre-induction physical examination at local board office, Learned, Kansas, at 4 p.m. on the 13th of November, 1945. Leave that night on the 920 train for Fort Leavenworth. Uh, Marjorie C. Van Horn. So, yeah, that's an, yet another month further on from the letters that we looked at a moment ago. Important notice to registrant. Registrant who believes he has a disqualifying defect if you believe you have some defect which will dequalify you for service, you may uh, appear in person. Da, 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 da. Okay, yeah. There's. When you report for pre induction physical examination, you will be forwarded to an induction station where you will be given a complete physical examination to determine whether you are physically fit for service. If you sign a request for immediate induction and you are found qualified for service, you will be inducted immediately following the completion of your pre-induction physical examination. Otherwise, upon completion of your pre-induction physical examination, you will be returned to this local board. Uh, okay. If you fail to report, if you're so far from your own local board that reporting in compliance will be a hardship. Let's see. Okay. 
If you pass your physical, your file will then be sent to the Board of Appeal as requested by your employer. And that's added on um, specifically for him, it looks like. Okay, Selective Service System, Transfer, Physical, or Pre-Induction Physical Examination. Date, September 1st, 1945. Uh, name, Robert Eldred Taylor, present address, care of Operations, Pan American Airways Incorporated, Brownsville, Texas. I present herewith my order to report pre-induction physical examination issued by Local Board 1, Pawnee, Kansas. Reason for absence from my own, own local board area working in Brownsville, Texas. I respectfully request that I be transferred pre for pre-induction physical examination to the local board having jurisdiction over my present address given above. I, if I am found qualified for service and ordered to report for induction, I request that I be inducted from... Neither one is checked, but I'm assuming uh, wanting to not have to go back to Kansas. Um, okay. Let's see. First, endorsement. This request for transfer for pre-induction physical examination is approved. Okay, so that approval just means that um, he doesn't ha have to go back to Kansas for the physical. If I'm reading this correctly, he got to stay in Texas for the physical. Um, so that was like November 1st. And then I have another one from November 24th. I think these are all fascinating. The, the, these documents tell a story, and I think it's really neat to see sort of that history unfold document by document. Um, November 24th, 1945, you're hereby directed to report for pre-induction physical examination. Uh, on the 3rd of December, 1945. And this is now Brownsville, Texas, instead of um, Larned, Pawnee, Kansas. Um, okay. There is resolution here. Resolution to the... Um, Saga, at least partly, Selective Service System, Local Board Number 1, Cameron County, Brownsville, Texas, Certificate of Fitness. Robert Eldred Taylor, I hereby certify that the above-named registrant has been given a pre-induction physical examination and found physically fit, acceptable for general military service. I'm just going to pull his photo in again because I just think... It's good to keep in mind who these documents are about. Um, date of examination, 5 December 1945. Rank, let's see, name, rank. So H.J. Cranmer, first lieutenant, uh, AUS. I'm not certain what that stands for. Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Um, I just love that our very first document in here is you can't go for aviation cadet training because you're colorblind. And, and now, three years later, three and a half years later, um, it's, well, you passed your physical. <laughs> No mention of the colorblindness at all. Um, so then we've got, let's see, two postcards it looks like. Uh, 46 and 47. But what is this? I think this, 
this has a staple and appears to be related to this. Yeah. <laughs> Which one turns into Captain America? <gasps> the little guy from New York. Uh, induction station. War Department Personnel Center, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Notice of acceptability. You have been found acceptable for military service. Your medical history and the result of this ex uh, your medical history and the result of this examination is final, and you will be considered acceptable for military service for 90 days, unless documentary evidence is forwarded through your Selective Service Local Board which indicates that you have a condition which would make you unacceptable. Signed, Raymond H. Fox, Lieutenant Colonel MC, uh, Chief Medical Examiner. So, I, the, the, the initial document does not say that he's not eligible for military service. The first, the initial document just says you can't join the aviation cadet training program because you're colorblind. It does not say not eligible for military service. So there is that distinction, but I, I just, it feels like a saga of no to you must. Um, February 7th, 1946, this is from the Selective Service Board in Pawnee, uh, Kansas, to uh, Robert Taylor, care of operations, Pan American Airways, Brown Airways, Brownsville, Texas. Notice of classification, Robert Eldred Taylor has been classified in class 2A. I am curious as to what that means. Um, until 23 July 1946, by Board of Appeal, by vote of 3 to 0, uh, February 7, 1946, M.C. Van Horn of Local Board, uh, who's the clerk, let's see. The law requires you subject to heavy penalty for violation to have this notice, in addition to your registration certificate, Form 2, in your personal possession at all times, to exhibit it upon request to authorized officials to surrender it upon entering the armed forces to your commanding officer, DSS Form 57. Notice of right to appeal. Appeal from classification by local board must be made within 10 days after the mailing of this notice. You may file a written notice, da 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 The law requires you to keep in touch with your local board, notify of any changes uh, in address, notify of any fact that might change your classification, comply with the instructions on the notice of classification part of this form. <laughs> MC Van Horn sounds like a 90s rapper. Um, I could see that. I could see that. Um, I'm not certain I'm going to find out what the classification uh, means. Like, what is class 2A? Ooh. Selective Training and Service Act of 1940. Oh, I am so glad I looked. So class 2 is deferred because of occupation. Class 2A, deferred in support of national health, safety, or interest. Um, but There's also a 2A with an F in parentheses that was in use, let's see, when was this, 1946? 
Ah, yeah, so the 2a was no longer in use. So this would be 2a f, um, which pre was, uh, the class was for previously rejected for military service. So his classification in class 2a is an indication um, that he was previously rejected for military service. There are technically five minutes left of stream. Do what you will with this information. We are almost done looking at every document in this collection. Um, there's just a, like two more. So I think we'll, we'll get through them. But thank you for letting me know the time because I was not paying attention. Um, so then we also have from uh, March 6th of... <laughs> So, 2 a.m. <laughs> uh, March 6, 1947, um, sent to operations for Pan American Airways, New Orleans. Um, let's see, 1947. Mm. It's, I'm going to have to look at an entirely new set of classifications. Um, I, I'm uncertain why and why he was reclassed or whether, like, I'm not certain what happened here, but the previous one, uh, class 2A, was assigned by the Board of Appeal in um, Kansas, and I, I feel like I don't know everything about what that means, but... Um, I don't have time to dig too far. But this one, uh, March 6th, 1947, classified in class 1C DISC, it looks like. Class 1C discharged. So this is um, confirmation of discharge from the armed forces, honorable discharge. So one C is honorable discharge. The other item in this collection, so that was all like just like documentation of um, his status with regard to military service during World War II. The other thing in here is a flight chart. Um, full of aeronautical symbols, topographical symbols, emergency advice, September 1945. Let's see. Uh, so he was assigned to the Latin American region, flying for Pan American. Um, and so there's information in here about uh, emergency advice for Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras and Nicaragua and Costa Rica and Panama. Advice for surviving at sea in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and like, I, this is a very interesting document. I personally think that this document much less interesting <laughs> than all of the um, war registration stuff, but still really interesting. Just to me, the, the like saga of, he enlisted, he wanted to be a pilot and fly for the army. Um, but, like in World War II which was a thing to do, like sign up for the, the Air Corps and you know that you're going to be in the Air Corps and not drafted somewhere else. So great. But then he was told, sorry, you can't do that because you're colorblind. Uh, so instead, we're going to send you over to Pan American and have you fly for them. You can't fly for us because you're colorblind, but you can go and be a co-pilot for Pan American. I just, that is the story I want to understand. That's the story told by the documents. There's more there. 
and I'm very curious about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is a map of um, the region that he flew for, or that he flew um, for Pan American Airways. So, yeah. It just, there is, there is a story here, and it, it looks to me like a really interesting story. Um, we've got the official documents uh, of the saga of his enlistment and registration with the um, Selective Service. But there's more to this story, and I would be really, <laughs> I would be really interested in, in learning it. Um, so I, I would, I would love to know more, but these are all the documents that we presently have. Um, but to me, it's all really interesting. Uh, I hope that that was fun for, for you all. Um, glancing at those things, sort of learning a bit about the, the U.S. draft. Um, despite having been registered for the draft, in, in, like as required when I was younger, I learned a lot about the draft by working on this. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have so many questions. I do too, Meridu. Like, there's so much more to this story, and I want to know it all. But um, sadly, we are out of time for Archival Adventures today. And we have actually, for once, looked at every single item in the collection. Um, I, I enjoyed this one a lot. And yeah, I, I like this one. Um, this is a, a good topic, uh, but we'll be moving on from it until next week when the topic is Ask an Archivist Day, <laughs> because um, next week on October 11th, it's Ask an Archivist Day. Uh, so instead of what I typically do, I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit. And um, I've grabbed a couple of unprocessed collections. And basically, I'm going to walk through looking at them, learning about them, and uh, how we approach building a finding aid. Um, and during that time, like, if people have questions, feel free to ask. And we'll just chat about archives and archival process, as well as the collections themselves, one of which is LGBTQ plus related, because not only is it Ask an Archivist Day next Wednesday, it's also National Coming Out Day in the US. So um, one of the collections relates to that. But the primary focus is Ask an Archivist Day. Um, and so yeah, that is next week at 2.30 PM. Um, Eastern time are right here. Let me see. I think I think I know where we're going. Um, mostly because I saw him in chat earlier. Um, so I feel like today's a great day to pop on over and say hi to Stephen Joyce, um, who is presently active. Uh, streaming, playing Paleo Pines, a uh, video game. Uh, but yeah, I hope everybody has had a fun time with this today. I'm going to start these raids. Um, I do want to say uh, thank you to Hell Reaver, or Hall Reaver, sorry, <laughs> for the follow. And uh, of course, thank you to 16-Bit Eric for the raid earlier. Um, I do hope that I will see uh, some or all of you back um, in the future for more archival adventures. Um, and 
I would love it if you would join me uh, to say hello to Stephen Joyce. Um, also a lovely community. Wears Tiny Hats has just absolutely lovely people um, and finds the best indie games to play. So I encourage you to, to join in with the raid and uh, say hello over there. Um, until I see you all again, I hope that you keep exploring history.